Welcome back to the 6th Gear Garage. Today, we'll be working on my 1985 Toyota. Rebuilding the knuckles. Because, look at that mess. I've got oil and grease leaking past the seals. It's been getting bad for a while now. So today, I'll show how easy it is to tear it down, replace all the seals, bearings, and put it back together as good as new. It's not a hard job, just long and messy. I bought this knuckle rebuild kit from Cruiser Outfitters. It's their sumo gear kit. Everything's made in Japan, so you know it's good quality. It comes with all the seals, knuckle bearings, hub gasket, new shims, dust seals, hub gaskets, and also inner and outer wheel bearings. I'll put a link to this kit in the description. And no, this isn't a sponsor video. I just really like the quality of their kits. I've also used their kit to rebuild the knuckles on my 80 series Land Cruiser a couple years ago and it's held up great. Let's do a quick rundown of all the tools I'll need for this job. Jack, jack stands, brass punch set. These will take the beating instead of damaging your parts because brass is soft. I'll put links for this stuff in the description by the way. Uh, you'll definitely want to get those. 54 millimeter socket. Spring scale to measure preload. I got this from Cruiser Outfitters as well. A two jaw puller, two 5 16 inch drill bits, or any rods about that size. This is a M8 by 1.25 bolt, and you'll need it to pull the axle outward when installing the snap ring. Big old snap ring pliers, regular needle nose, a little tiny chisel, 10 millimeter socket on a quarter inch ratchet, 3 8 inch ratchet and a socket set. I've also got a half inch socket set and a half inch extension, a breaker bar, and a torque wrench, a 12 millimeter wrench, vice grips, a BFH, seal puller, this is just a universal one, wire brush and a regular brush, a magnet, that's optional but I'll show how it makes life easier when reassembling everything. 32 millimeter socket I'll be using as a driver for the axle oil seal or you could buy an actual driver. A couple big flatheads. The cutoff wheel is optional. I'll show how it saves me from having to bleed the brakes. Paper towels. At least one roll per side. Dupacolor prep spray. Forget brake cleaner. This stuff right here is what cuts down the molly grease. Get a few cans of this and a little bit of brake cleaner just to clean any grease off of the rotor. I'm going to need a one pound tub of molly grease for each knuckle and a pound tub of high temp uh, wheel bearing grease. One tub is enough for both sides. Some PB Blaster is always on the list here in Rusty, Ohio. A couple of 6x6 blocks to set the hub on and a pair of rubber gloves for packing the grease into the bearings. I grabbed this uh, plastic cupcake tray from the recycle bin it has all these compartments to keep all the bolts and nuts sorted. Oh, I almost forgot. Grab a couple of your wife's favorite baking pans to put under the knuckle so you don't get grease all over the garage floor. This video applies to the 79 to 85 four wheel drive US trucks and 4Runner, as well as the 40, 50, 60, and FJ62 Land Cruiser from 1975 through 1989. They all use the exact same kit. First, lift the side you're working on and get a jack stand under the axle and remove the wheel. This knuckle is coated in grease. I'll hose it down with some prep spray to start breaking down the grime. And it drips right into the pan. Now my hub and brakes probably look different than yours. This is an old school sky widening kit from like 2005 and it uses IFS hubs these are FJ60 rotors and calipers from a 94 V6 4Runner. If you're interested in this setup, let me know in the comments and I'll explain it all in another video. And this is a high steer kit by Trail Gear. I'll put a link to that install in the description. The first thing I need to do is remove the caliper. I'm using a flathead and popping off this C-clip for the brake line fitting. And here's what that looks like. Now I've got to remove the clip underneath, and that's what the vice grips are for. Just clamp down and wiggle it out, and there's that. Now you'll notice 
that uh, this line here is preventing me from moving the caliper. It's stuck in this bracket on the dust shield. So rather than disconnecting the brake line and having to bleed the brakes, I just cut a little slit there to slide the brake line through. That way, I don't have to open the brake lines. I'm going to turn the wheel and give myself some more room to work. Next, I remove the two caliper mounting bolts. I've got the caliper supported on a jack stand here, and that made enough room for me to cut a slit here with the cutoff wheel. <laughs> if you do this, just be careful not to cut the brake line. Then I file down any sharp edges at the cut. There! No more bleeding brakes every time I remove the caliper. There's years of grime back here. I like to start by scraping off the worst with a screwdriver. Wow, that's a little better. Let the prep spray get to work on the rest of that. It's hard to loosen the bolts when the hub spins. So lock both hubs, put it in gear and four wheel drive, and that will lock it in place. Next, I loosen the six cover bolts and the six hub bolts. Now I can turn this back to free and remove the six bolts and pull off the cover. If you look inside there, there's a snap ring right there. Save this. Next, I remove the nuts and washers from the locking hub housing. And now I'm left with the cone washers and some rust. I'm gonna let these soak with some PB Blaster. They're usually a pain to remove. This is the first of many times I'll be using the brass drift set. What you can do is hit this stud on the end and hope the cone washer will vibrate loose. We'll see if they budged at all. No. They're not turning at all. None of them. All right, the next thing to try is give the hub some taps. Just be sure not to hit the threads on the wheel studs. Now this impact goes straight to the wheel bearings, but I'm replacing those anyways. Still nothing. Now I have a punch. And if you hit the cone washer at the split, that can pop them loose. Obviously, I want to avoid hitting the thread on the studs. There we go. One down. Okay, I didn't want to have to do this, but BFH time. All right, that worked. Just don't hit the studs. That one just hit me in the leg. That one moved. These are getting pretty beat up over the years. And pull off the locking hub housing. Looks like the last person to put this together used RTV instead of a gasket. I'll have to scrape that off and get the surface cleaned up. Let's wipe off some of this grease here. And there's a look at the 54 millimeter nut. Before I can loosen the nut, I have to bend these tabs on the lock washer away from the nut. Another one here. There's usually one bent outward and one bent inward. I'm using a small chisel to bend the tab. Just wanna hit it back so it's flat. Now I can loosen the 54 millimeter nut. And there it is. And the lock washer. Let's get some of this uh, grease out of here. And there's the adjusting nut, also 54 millimeter. It's the exact same nut as the lock nut. They just call them different names. Save both of these nuts, by the way. Uh, but the kit 
does come with new lock washers. And here is the thrust washer. Save this too. And here's the outer wheel bearing. Toss that. And then pull off the entire hub and rotor assembly. And here's the spindle. If your truck has seen its fair share of mud over the years, then yours might also look like this. Next, I cleaned up most of the dirt with a wire brush. Now, remove the 14 millimeter bolts on the dust seal. Throw away the old dust seal, and here's the dust cover that goes behind the rotor. Turn it clockwise a little. This 12 millimeter bolt here almost always breaks on me. So I just leave it in place now and rotate the cover to take it off and put it back on. It's just much easier that way. I'm going to clean this up and hopefully slow down the rust. These are like over a hundred bucks to replace and that's if you can find them. Get some of the dirt off of the perimeter here. Get a punch and tap the flat side here to rotate it and eventually it will spin loose. My bad guys, I should have been using the brass drip for this so I don't ding up the edge of the spindle. Sometimes they hang on. Just gotta keep rotating it until it comes off. That's loose. Again, the previous owner used RTV here. The new kit comes with every gasket so I won't have to mess with RTV. I'll set this aside and clean it up. I took a minute to clean up some of the excess grease. I try and keep things clean as I go, otherwise the molly grease will end up on tools, the floor, me, and in the house. It's just easier to clean it in one place. All right, so looking at this burr field here, you can see there's a flat spot near the top there, covered in grease. I need to rotate the axle to get that flat spot on top. Having a front locker, I did that by rotating the other wheel with the hub locked in. And with that flat spot facing up, the burr field and the axle should slide right out. This is the uh, passenger side axle. The driver side is a lot longer because the uh, diff is offset. This berth wasn't clicking or making any noises, so I'm not going to replace it. I did replace the burr field in the video of my 80 series knuckle rebuild. So I'll have a link in the description to show how to separate the axle from the berf, how to properly pack molly grease into the new berf, and how I like to set the snap ring for the axle in the new berf because that can be a pain. This is actually a burr field from an 80 series Land Cruiser. And look at how much beefier it is than the one from my truck. See that NTN stamp? That's an OEM burr field. I wrapped it up to keep everything clean until it's time to put it back in. There's my mess so far. I'm going to be removing these and those down there. And these are filthy. So I'm going to scrape off some of this grime. Then I crack them all loose with a breaker bar. Time to pop these ball joints out. First, I need to remove the cotter pins. And now I can loosen the castle nuts. Here's where I need the two jaw puller. And sometimes this works well, other times it gets pretty sketchy. I remember in the 80 series knuckle video, this didn't go well. These can pop off with some real force. It actually broke the puller. Now comes the sketchy part. Notice I'm wearing gloves. Wow, that was the easiest one I've ever done. It's never that easy. Let's see if this one is that nice. Nah. See, this is what happens. 
it always starts to go sideways. Then I got to loosen it, retighten it, and sideways again. All right, I've got the castle nut back on there so I don't damage the threads when I give it some taps with this big hammer. See if that did anything. And that helped. Now I can turn the knuckle and see all these 10 millimeter bolts covered in grime. Time to remove all those. There's eight total. Then you may have to pry this apart. There's the lower retainer, the felt seal. There's the upper retainer popping out too. And then the rubber seal. So that's the same order that this has to go back together. Now remove the nuts from the steering arm. Get some of this dried mud out of here. And get the washers out next. Might as well let these soak for a bit. Now I've got the big old fatty brass drift and uh, we'll see if I can knock these cone washers loose. Nope. And no. That rarely works. Should have just started by hitting the knuckle arm. There we go. Before I pull this all the way off and the knuckle flops around everywhere, I'm gonna loosen the bottom nuts next. There's a quick look at the comb washers. So two of the studs came out with the nuts. The threads were probably so filthy that the nut didn't want to come off. I'll show how to put those back in later, just in case this happens to you too. Let's remove the top first. It's already pretty loose. Just give it some taps. And it lifts right off with the cone washers. Here's a better look at one of those. And I've got the medium drift here. And I'm going to put it through the top hole and hit the top of the lower bearing cap. And done. All right, so there's the arm and the lower cap. And notice up here, a shim got left behind. See, no shim here, one shim there. Keep track of where these shims go because that will be important later. Behind all of this grease is a bearing that you can't see. If I can push that bearing up, I'll be able to slide this knuckle off. This is gonna take two hands. The bearing is just hanging down a little bit and getting in the way. So if I can push it back up in place for a second while pulling on the knuckle, boop, there goes the bearing. And here's the knuckle. And there's the top bearing. And a lot of molly grease. Pull off the metal ring, twist it open to uh, get it over the knuckle, and the rubber seal, and the felt, all to the trash. Next I clean the axle housing inside and out. Lots of paper towels and lots of prep spray. I agitated greasy hardware in a jar of degreaser and removed the worst of the grease from the knuckle housing. I've got a big flathead and I'm gonna remove the oil seal. My universal puller alone is too small for this job. See, it doesn't reach across. But if I wedge the flathead under it, now I've got a surface to press against. And I just go around to a few different spots on the seal. You can buy 
special service tools to remove all these oil seals, or just get creative with what you have. Oh, you know what? I forgot to use the blocks here. I'm losing my leverage because the whole hub is rocking back and forth. Then the seal popped right out, along with the wheel bearing. Next, I started cleaning up some of the excess grease on the inside, and then the outside. Next, I took the knuckle, spindle, hub, arm, and bearing cap outside for a quick pressure washing to remove any old remaining grease or dirt. This saved me a lot of time, paper towels, and degreaser. So even if you don't have access to a pressure washer, it's still worth the trip to the car wash. Then I cleaned up and masked the knuckles for a fresh coat of paint. I have another video on painting cast iron parts where I painted a master cylinder. I'll put that link in the description if you're interested in the steps and products I use to paint these knuckles. I had some pretty bad pitting on the ball of the axle housing. If yours are this bad, don't worry, there's an easy fix. First, grind the ball with a wire wheel to remove all the surface rust in the pitting. After cleaning the surface, apply some JB Weld using a squeegee. So you can really force the JB Weld down into the pits on the surface. No need to go heavy, it'll just be more to sand down later. I'm only applying it thick enough to fill in the pits and end up flush with the rest of the surface. While the JB Weld cures, I'll go ahead and tap out these bearing races. Notice the little notch on each side. Same with the top. I can hit with the brass drift through the top and go back and forth on each side of the race. And eventually, it'll fall out through the bottom. Then, do the same on the top race. Just go back and forth with the brass drift hitting the race on each side of the notch and it will slowly come out. Here are the wheel bearings and knuckle bearings from the kit. I'm grabbing all the races from the bearings as well as the oil seals. This little guy is the axle seal and I'm gonna set them in the freezer to get them as cold as possible because as we know when things get cold they shrink ever so slightly, sometimes more. Okay, next morning here, and the JB Weld has cured. I have some higher points here where I laid it down a little thick. So I'm gonna knock those down first with some 80 grit. A little bit there. That feels good. Now I'm sanding the whole surface with 180 grit, and this will make the whole thing smooth and even. Getting there. Still have a high spot right here. This is good here. It feels smooth when I run my finger over it. Same with this side. Clean any dust and dirt up in here. And I'll install the new bearing race. Here's one frozen bearing race. And it's slightly contracted from the cold, so it should go in a little easier. Just put the brass drift across and give it some taps. And it's in. And repeat for the lower bearing race. If the race starts to go in crooked, just tap more on the opposite side. Make sure they're both all the way in, nice and flush. Now for the axle seal. This universal puller works great for this. And toss this out. Clean up all this old grease and I'm putting a little bit of new grease around the edge to help the new oil seal slide in easier. 
I try to hold it with my hands as little as possible because that will cause it to warm up and expand back to regular size. You can buy a seal driver, but I've done this enough to where I'm comfortable using a socket. This is 32 millimeters. And I just have to be careful that I hit it in perfectly straight. So I stop and check a lot at first. Then if one side is in farther, I can hit the opposite side. That looks perfect. Then I like to run my finger around the perimeter and make sure it feels all the way flush. And it's good. Take a look at your axle, and if you have a groove here from the oil seal, and you can catch your thumbnail on it, then there's a good chance your new seal will also leak, if it's in that exact same spot. They make uh, speedy sleeves to go over the groove. I've never used them, but it's a lot cheaper than a new axle. Or, they also make drivers to overdrive the oil seal to position it in a different spot. Cruiser Outfitters sells those. Before I put the axle back in, I've got some molly grease here to apply around the edge here. And I just want to fill that little groove going all the way around the oil seal. That way you have some lube between the metal axle and the rubber seal. Because when I go to install it, it's almost impossible not to drag the axle on the seal just a little bit. Here's a closer look at the grease and the groove of the oil seal. This much is good. Here's the new oil seal set and they're gonna go on the axle in this order. First the felt seal. These always fit tight so it takes a little convincing to fit it over the ball. I'm forcing it on pretty hard. I've never had one rip or tear. Sometimes you gotta give it the business. And then the rubber seal next. There's no inside or outside edge on this application. And last comes the metal ring. Twist it open. And then kind of bend it back once it's over the ball so it rests closed. I tightened the stud nut back into the knuckle, then cleaned the threads and was able to remove just the nut. Now it's time to pack some bearings. I like to wear rubber gloves for this part. It gets pretty messy. These knuckle bearings get the molly grease. And I like to scoop some up, like guacamole on a chip, wipe it on my palm, and then keep pressing the bottom edge of the bearing into the palm of my hand where the grease is. Just keep pressing the bearing down into the grease and that forces the grease inside the bearing. And I keep doing this until eventually it starts to ooze out at the top edge. That's when you know that part is packed with grease. You can see it start to ooze out right there. And now I just have to make that happen all the way around the whole bearing. Then it should look about like this. And I like to go around the outside once and press a little extra grease in the rollers. And that's how I make sure a bearing is fully packed with grease. Drop in the top knuckle bearing. For the lower bearing, if I pick it up and set it in place, it's just gonna fall out. Here's where the magnet comes in handy. I could turn this one on and off. So set it in the knuckle, turn it to on, and now it's not moving anywhere. Now I can put the bearing into the race and it stays in place. And that makes it so much easier to slip the knuckle on over the ball. Here's the freshly painted knuckle. This plug is to add grease with the grease gun. The plug faces up to the front. I hold it by the stops here and carefully put it over the ball. Remember those spacers I showed earlier? The kit came with new ones. 
but they're actually thinner than the original ones. Maybe not quite half as thick. So rather than stack two of the thinner ones and chance it being a little too thin, I clean up the old one and I'll reuse it. I have the arm all cleaned up and I'm putting a little bit of grease right here where it contacts the bearing and the outside as well where it goes in the knuckle. That's good. And do the same for the lower bearing cap. Now I'm gonna throw them in the freezer for a while. It makes them contract a tiny bit which makes them go together a little easier. All right, I have a frozen knuckle arm and I put the grease on before putting them in the freezer so that it doesn't start to warm up while I'm putting the grease on after taking it out. Especially when it's 80 something degrees in the garage this week. And drop in the four cone washers, then the regular washers, and throw on a couple of nuts hand tight, just to hold it in place for now. And here's the frozen bearing cap. And don't forget the proper shim. As I'm pushing it in, I'm wiggling the knuckle a little until the cap lines up with the bearing. Now it's in place. And throw a washer and nut on there. And a washer and nut on there. Then I used a ratchet to get all the upper and lower nuts tightened evenly by hand which also pulled everything together. Now I'm done with the magnet. There's the lower bearing and the upper. Before I can torque these down to spec and dial in the preload, I'm gonna let everything warm up to room temperature. I don't know if these parts expanding would be enough to throw off the preload specs, but I'd rather play it safe than find out the hard way. So let's work on the hub for a while. I still need to remove the old outer bearing race and the inner bearing race. And a couple six by six blocks are the perfect height to set this on. If you look inside the hub, you can see there's a notch here and a notch here. Just like before, I'm gonna tap on opposite sides to knock it out. Just one tap at a time. It's moving a lot now. And there it is. Next I use the same method to remove the inner bearing race by tapping through the front of the hub. Then I cleaned out any remaining grease or brass shavings. Now I have the red high temp grease and get a little bit and spread it around the edge where the new race goes in. A little lube helps. And do the same for the inner bearing race. And here's one ice cold outer race. And I'm using the old race to drive it in. Set the brass drift across and give it some taps. Need a little more. Now the old race is stuck. I should have flipped it around. Usually just takes a couple light taps from the back to knock it out. There it is. I'll just give the new race a couple more taps to make sure it's all the way in. Now for the inner bearing race. Nice and cold. Freezing these really does help them go in easier. Now the race is flush, so the drift won't push it in anymore. So grab the old inner race. Oops, that's the outer. And if I use it like this, I'm not gonna have a lip to use to tap it back out. So, Flip it so the thicker side faces down, and then I can easily tap it out when it gets stuck. It's going.
and she's in. Once again, the old race is stuck, but since I put that one in the right way, thick side down, I can just tap it out with the drift and not touch the new race. I know you guys can't see, but I'm on the lip of the old race here. And it's out. Here's a close look at a good used brass drift. They will mushroom after a while and I'll have to grind the end down. But they take the beating and that's what you want. Okay, back from a lunch break and it's time to tighten these 17 millimeter nuts. One thing to watch out for is when I torque this, the arm's gonna turn and the stopper can pinch the new seals. So just be sure that's pushed out of the way so it doesn't get pinched. And when I tighten the lower nuts, the knuckle's gonna turn this way. And once again, it can pinch that seal if you're not careful. I torqued the nuts to 71 feet pounds. Now I've torqued the upper and lower nuts. Make sure the knuckle still turns freely and it feels good. Now to check the preload with the spring scale. It should be between 6.6 .6 and 13.2 uh, pounds or three to six kilograms if you're not in America. So take this hook and put it through the arm and pull slow and steady. And if you saw that, I'm right at the minimum, 6.6 .6 pounds slash three kilograms. Now the high steer arm has two holes instead of the stock arm that just has one. So I like to check the preload using both holes and then take an average of both. Just because they don't say which hole to check if you have this arm. So that's about 10 pounds or four and a half kilograms from the inside hole. You get more leverage on the outside hole since it's farther away from the knuckle and that's why it takes less effort to turn compared to the inside hole. The shims on the top and bottom of the knuckle is how to adjust the preload. So less shims is gonna put more torque on the bearings, making it tighter to turn. And adding shims is gonna make the knuckle easier to turn. Now I can put the tie rods back in the arm. Tighten the castle nuts to 67 feet pound of torque and reinstall the cotter pins. Now I'm gonna work on the back side of the knuckle so I can get this mess out of the way. I have metal ring, rubber seal, and felt. The slit in the metal ring faces straight up and it fits in there. Then the rubber seal goes over top like this. And the felt seal has two holes that are closer together and those line up on the sides. Now grab one of the retainers and get the holes lined up and get one of these 10 millimeter bolts started by hand while making sure everything stays in place. And then the other one. And I'm just giving them a couple quick turns so they don't fall out. And grab the other half of the retainer. Oh, by the way, these go on so the beveled edge matches the shape of the ball. And then these outer edge bevels go toward the knuckle. Again, make sure everything is in place. The metal ring and rubber seal should be in the recessed part of the knuckle. So the rubber seal ends up being flush with the outer surface of the knuckle. And once everything is good, get the other half of the retainer in place and get a bolt in there. Not all the way tight yet, just enough to hold everything in place for now. And one more. And I like to take one last peek in here and make sure everything is still in place. And then I can put the other four bolts in. The spec for these is about five foot pounds, so not tight at all. 
Now it's time to reinstall the axle. I like to add some extra molly grease on here. And if you replace the burr fields, then I'll have a link in the description on how to pack those with the molly grease. I like to wipe a little on the axle itself because it's about impossible not to contact the oil seal a little bit when sliding the axle in place. Especially if it's the longer left side. So a little grease will help it slide on the seal without dragging the rubber as much. And make sure the flat spots on the berf are on the top and bottom, just like when pulling it out. This thing is really fighting me. Just keep trying. It will go in eventually. There it is. And there it goes. And it's not turning, so that means the splines on the axle are lined up in the diff. Sometimes you have to rotate a little bit to get those splines lined up. Now I need to pack the knuckle with molly grease. Just try and squeeze it back in there. They say to only pack it about three quarters full of grease to allow room for expansion when warm. But considering there's no way I could have ever pushed the grease all the way to the back of the knuckle with my fingers, sometimes I'd go a little more than that. Okay, the surface is all clean. Here's those two 5 16 inch drill bits I showed earlier in the video. And notice the spindle gasket has one, two, three flat sides and a rounded edge on top. Just slide that guy on and put some on this bushing on the back of the spindle too. Just smear it in those grooves. This drain at the bottom faces down. Then slide the spindle over the axle or burfield and on the drill bits. And this round gasket goes over the spindle. Notice the cutout faces the bottom with the drain, and next comes the dust shield, which I also cleaned up and painted. Remember, I left this bracket on the back because I didn't want to snap that nut. And I need to rotate the shield because the bracket has to go behind those caliper mounting points. So I need to rearrange the drill bits. I'm taking this one out and putting it up here, and taking this one out and setting it aside for now. And this will allow the dust shield to rotate. Just put it over the one hole like that. And then this bracket will barely clear the caliper mount. Now rotate it back in place. And go back to two drill bits to help balance everything in place. Next comes the dust seal. No gasket, it just goes right over the shield. Flat sides on the sides. I think it only goes on one way because of the uh, spacing of the holes. Next I reinstall the 8 bolts on the dust seal and tighten them down to 34 feet pounds of torque. Now it's time to pack the wheel bearings for the hub. The inside gets the bigger one and the smaller one goes on the outside. I packed the wheel bearings with grease using the same method I showed earlier. Except this time, I used the high temperature red bearing grease instead of the molly grease. Then I packed some extra red grease inside the hub. Here I have one frozen oil seal. And drive it in using the brass drift. Nice and flush. Wipe some of the red grease on the edge of the rubber seal as well. A little extra doesn't hurt here. Be sure to clean the back of the rotor before installing the hub. I've got some grease right there. Dirty. Let's do one more. That's just surface rust. Now carefully slide the hub on in place. 
There's a lip back in there that the wheel bearing has to slide over. There it is. That's in place. Now install the outer wheel bearing. All the way in. And the thrust washer. It only goes on one way with the tab at the top. Throw some grease on this guy as well. I clean the outside of the rotor before I forget, since I'm done getting it greasy. Now thread on the locking nut. Just hand tight for now. Now I'm going to torque it down to 43 uh, pound feet of torque. Now give the hub some spins. Just a few rotations in each direction is good. Now retorque the nut again to 43 foot pounds. It should turn a tiny bit more. This still feels good. Now loosen the adjusting nut until it can be turned by hand, like this. And then I just turn it hand tight. Give it a spin, still feels good. Now I'll check the preload with the spring gauge to see if it's actually good. And it's about five pounds, that's good. I want to be between 0.9 pounds and 7.31 pounds, or 0.4 to 3.3 kilograms. I might have got a little carried away with the grease here on the thrust washer. All right, that's better. Now for the lock washer. A new one came with the kit. And it fits in the same groove as the thrust washer. Then thread on the other 54 millimeter nut, the locking nut. Tighten the nut to 58 feet pounds of torque. Still feels okay to me. But we'll know for sure with the spring scale. I'm right around 6 pounds. So I'm still within that range of 0.9 pounds to 7.31 pounds. If it was more than 7.31 pounds, I'd have to go back and slightly loosen the hand tight adjusting nut. Then put the lock washer and locking nut back on and retorque to 58 feet pounds and recheck the preload with the spring gauge. I need to bend one of these tabs back and one forward. This one lines up with the flat side of the locking nut. Bend it forward. And this one lines up with the adjusting nut. Give it some taps and bend it backwards. Here's a better look at that one. Now everything's locked in place. Next I clean the mounting surface for the locking hub housing. And there's the gasket for the locking hub. I've got the mating surface on the locking hub all cleaned up. And notice there's these two holes in the back. Here they are in the front under these little nubs. And that's how this has to go on. Get the splines lined up with the axle. There it is. And get the comb washers. And do yourself or whoever might be working on your truck down the road a huge favor and line up all of the notches of the comb washers so that they're facing the outside. That's going to make life much easier when it comes time to take this apart again. Next, install the washers and nuts and just get them hand tight for now. And put a little extra molly grease into the locking hub. Now I need to put the snap ring on the end of the axle, but it's pushed in a little too far. So I've got the M8 by 1.25 bolt with the washer on it. Sometimes the washer makes it easier to pull out. Just thread it in the end of the axle, then pull out. And now the axle is out far enough to get the snap ring in the groove. You can see it there with the red grease on it. 
This is more challenging with small snap ring pliers. And just make sure it's all the way in the groove. And we're good. Next up is the hub cover. Apply some more molly grease in there. And some more. Nice and greasy. Kitty, checking to make sure I'm doing a good job. Watch out, Lindor. Time for some prep spray. I'm making sure there's no grease on this surface before I put the gasket on. And clean the back side of the cover as well. And there's the new gasket that came with the kit. Notice two of these don't have a notch in the middle like the others do. You can see there's a little tab here and another tab on the opposite side. Those fit into those two grooves without the notch. Then install the 10 millimeter bolts onto the cover. These only get tightened to seven feet pounds. And then lock the hub and tighten the hub nuts to 23 feet pounds. Next, turn the wheel to gain more room to work and reinstall the brake caliper and tighten the caliper mounting bolts to 65 feet pounds of torque. Then reinstall the C-clip on the brake line and on the underside of the bracket, install the sliding metal clip to hold the brake line in place. It usually takes some taps with the hammer to help it go in. And when it's all back together, it should look like this. And I didn't even have to bleed the brakes. Next, reinstall the wheel and torque the lugs to 76 foot-pounds for aluminum wheels or 101 foot-pounds for steel wheels. And if I ever need to add molly grease to the knuckle, there's a square half-inch plug here that I can remove and put a grease gun into. But hopefully, it'll be another 100,000 miles before these are leaking like they were before. Do me a huge favor and give this a thumbs up if you found it helpful. That really helps the channel grow. Hit me up in the comments if you have any questions. And consider subscribing for more how-to videos and Project Fecal updates here at the 6th Gear Garage. Thanks for watching. Hey, there's a link to my store in the description where you'll find all kinds of rad Yoda merchandise like shirts, hoodies, posters, phone cases, and a lot more. Thanks to everyone out there who supports the channel. It really means a lot to me to see people wearing something I designed.